Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Deatra Hill. I am a biology major and also an anthropology minor here at IUP. Um, so to start off, the Community Resilience and Vulnerability Project is a multi-method project that engages both qualitative and qualitative data to better understand the landscape of COVID-19 epidemic in our region and how it has impacted the job force, um, opioid recovery, food security, and social support systems. Our project is a collaboration between IUP students from the Anthropology of Food, um, Environmental Anthropology, the Analysis of Social Data classes, and, our also, and also our community partner, the um, Chevy Chase Community Center. Um, so with COVID-19, opioid use disorder, and like food insecurity, it can be analyzed as a syndemic or a combination of multiple health crises that interact in a unique pattern to create compound harm or, and it is considered a global health um, concept as well. Um, COVID-19 has essentially destabilized people's access to OUD recovery tools and has profoundly destabilized food security among our citizens. So our student-led project aims to understand in what ways and to what consequences. So it is important to mention that our project, our original project was to focus on only COVID-19 and OUD, but as soon as we realized that our food insecurity was a major issue for our Northern Appalachian community, we shifted our project to focus on the resilience and vulnerability of our community in the face of the pandemic of COVID, OUD and um, food insecurity as well. So now I will turn it over to Alyssa. Good afternoon. I'm Alyssa Voss. I'm a junior anthropology major at IUP. So the pandemic has created uncertainty and a much greater need to provide access to food. And this is especially to those who are uncertain of where their next meal will come from, be it due to illness, loss of work, loss of wages, et cetera. I'm focusing on the ways in which the communities have come together in order to address this issue. They do so by increasing food pantry volunteers and donations, partnering with different organizations that allow for food delivery to pantries that are in need, and providing funds for organizations focusing on those who've lost their jobs during the pandemic and find themselves in an uncertain area in terms of food accessibility. So 412 Food Rescue specifically focuses on the gathering or saving of food from local businesses and retailers and transporting it to community-based organizations that ensure the food isn't wasted and goes to those in need. Similarly, other groups such as Meals on Wheels have extended their reach to getting food to high-risk groups such as the elderly. There are many more examples that show the community's ability to overcome this pandemic and ensure everyone is fed. Hello, my name is John Apollonia and I'm a senior anthropology major at IUP. Um, today, I'd like to discuss the research projects that students from Dr. Poole's environmental anthropology class are conducting on how Appalachian communities respond to environmental hazards and disasters. In light of our current COVID context, an anthropologically informed understanding of vulnerability and risk can contribute immensely relevant information for community well-being. We advocate describing vulnerability and risk within this framework because much anthropological inquiry asserts that risk of a hazard like COVID-19 is profoundly forged by its socioecological context. One reason is that risk perception of the same hazard often varies cross-culturally, shaped by how people think about their relationship with their environment. Additionally, a socioecological framework helps us address the fundamentally political nature of risk. By emphasizing the role of systems of power in distributing risk unevenly, Political ecology enables us to complicate our understanding of vulnerability and situate hazards within the interplay of broader political, economic, and environmental factors. We look forward to sharing these results in the future. Hello, my name is Casey Doyle. I'm a senior anthropology archeology span student at IUP. In my project, I'm researching sustainability and the COVID-19 pandemic. Sustainability is one of the most complex issues with which we are faced today. During the COVID-19 pandemic, this has become increasingly harder as there has been a uh, 
change in consumption patterns, including food instability and a dramatic increase in plastic usage. The way that we truly quantify sustainability is through physical well being, the level to which someone is able to stay true to their values, um, how much agency someone has in their life, and the level of inequality as a society. Unequal consumption is highlighted such as quality. Resilience in this pandemic includes efforts to stay sustainable in an age that is very pre-packaged. In our own community, for example, farmers markets have been a great tool for sustainability. Hi, my name is Rich Patterson. I'm a doctoral student in the administrative, Administration and Leadership Studies program at uh, IUP. I was looking specifically at uh, household assets and food insecurity. Um, those households that have some difficulty liquidating or liquidating uh, some of their assets, such as borrowing money, um, liquidating specific assets, or significantly higher, at higher risk for food insecurities. Um, if those individuals own their home versus renting, uh, again, those who rent seem to have be less likely to liquidate some of those resources more quickly and maybe have to um, divert some of those resources away from food acquisition. Um, interestingly, low income uh, individuals with uh, food insecurity are less related or sorry, income is, is less related to uh, specific income um, uh, as opposed to household assets. So vehicle ownership, savings, money, mutual funds, things like that seem to be more indicative of those individuals with uh, food insecurity. In terms of spending contributions, uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, chronic health conditions uh, have a significant impact on food insecurity, along with the type of healthcare insurance. Those individuals with public versus private may be more susceptible to food insecurity. Uh, the amount of household debt is also an indicator. Uh, medical debt specifically, uh, the difference between 4,000 and 3,000 um, seem to be a, a pretty significant change. Credit card debt is also a significant indicator. So those individuals that actually have credit cards were able to be uh, more, more food secure than those individuals with uh, no credit card. Uh -uh. I'm Chris Clauser. I'm a first year doctoral student in the administration leadership program at IEP. I researched geographical variation in food insecurity rates and found uh, a key study by Gunderson et al. measured how those rates varied by the rural urban continuum code and region of the country. Uh, food insecurity is not evenly distributed geographically. Rural areas typically have higher food insecurity rates than metro and metro adjacent areas. Uh, Indiana County specifically, is uh, it, its continuum code is four, and it has a food insecurity rate of about 14.4%. Interestingly, this is closer to the national average for counties like Indiana than the Northeast regional average. Uh, it may be worth investigating whether and how Indiana differs from similarly coded Northeastern counties. Next slide, please. I also looked at barriers to achieving food security that affect rural and semi-rural areas in addition to uh, urban areas. Uh, first, financial insecurity is a key barrier. Food is a fungible expense and unemployed and underemployed people often have to prioritize their food expenses last among other expenses like power, childcare, transportation, and so forth. Second, uh, inadequate food store availability Food deserts are actually a concern for rural areas and where they form, we see both an increased need to travel longer distances to secure food and as well uh, and increased use of food support services like food pantries. Finally, transportation, transportation itself is a key barrier. One urban study showed that food insecure families frequently did not use or have personal vehicles 
uh, they could use to get to food stores. Uh, in rural areas, longer distances and lack of widespread public transit only complicate this uh, and leave personal vehicles or rides from friends as one of the few, if not only, means to get to food stores. Hi, I'm Lamia Dawood, PhD student in administration leadership. According to recent research, 20% of black adults are suffering hunger compared to 7% of white adults, whereas 19% of Latinos reported higher hunger rates than their white and Asian counterparts. 57% of Hispanic women and 53.6 black single mothers lost their income compared to 41% among white men and women. As of September 2020, the unemployment rate among black women was 11.1% compared to 6.9% among white women and 6.5% among white men. Next slide, please. According to Feeding America, Around 54 million Americans, including one in four children, may suffer hunger and food insecurity because of the pandemic. Before the pandemic, more than 37 million people were already considered food insecure. The meal statistics were between four and five million pounds of food per month That's before the pandemic, but by March 2020, uh, eight million pounds were served, 9.5 million pounds in April, 10 million pounds in May. 40% of this is increase is for people who had never been to a food bank before, and nearly 39 million people have applied for benefits for the first time to the food banks. The Food Bank of New York also reported that from February 2020, the level of food insecurity was 9.4%, but after COVID-19, the, the rate of food insecurity for households with children more than tripled to 29.5%. My name is Raven Rose Rowland. I'm a criminology and philosophy major with a pre-law focus. I'm in my senior year and will be graduating this December. I will be a first generation college student, breaking multiple systemic barriers, resilience. COVID-19 nationwide has had a disproportionate effect on black people. Black Americans are two to three times more likely to die of COVID-19 than their white counterparts. Racism, not race, drives this. Inequity and inequality. Black Americans face not one public health crisis, but two. Racism in COVID-19. During the months of COVID-19, racism has finally been labeled as a public health crisis after the viral video of police murdering George Floyd. For my research, I will be looking at effects of racism and COVID-19 in Indiana County and Indiana County, focusing on vulnerability and resilience. Hello everyone, my name is Megan Grant and I am a senior speech language pathology major with a certificate in cultural competencies. I am currently doing some research on the impact that COVID-19 has had on the elderly members of my community, which is about 20% of my community that is has a population of around 3,800. The sudden lack of resources created scarcity for many of these vulnerable people in my community, but my research is proving that we have been able to bounce back by creating Facebook groups to pull resources, delivery chains to provide goods to our most vulnerable members, and mask making and donating these masks. Looking towards the future, I hope that this has inspired people to provide more care for their elders, and with cases grow growing currently, I think we will have to continue these practices well into the new year.
Hi, my name is Madison Cooper. I am a senior at IUP, um, public health major with a global health minor. Um, as a way to analyze food security or insecurity in Indiana County, we partnered with the Chevy Chase Community Center. The center recently increased their production of weekly meals to become a wider reaching service that is available to basically anyone in the county. The meals are reduced prices at only $5 a meal and are sometimes sponsored by local businesses to either pay for the entirety of the cost or to provide volunteers to make them. Um, these lunches are nutritious and are personally delivered to the door in a safe and protected manner. And because of the, many of these meals are specifically for seniors in the community, the delivery also acts as a safety check-in for those who were isolated and didn't have anyone to look over them or take care of them. Um, during the corona shutdown, Indiana County, just like many other counties, suffered from a loss of jobs and financial security. This service offered a way for many people to be fed and underprivileged members of the community through nutritious and well-rounded meals that also connected people to food that they were used to having um, and that they felt comfortable with. In times of chaos, having these regional foods um, was able to just provoke happy, comforting memories um, that can go a long way in soothing the overwhelming fears and anxiety that the past couple months have brought. Hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Seidel and I'm a senior public health major with a minor in global health at IUP. My contribution to this project will build off some previous work that I had already investigated for last year's ATP conference, which was researching the opioid epidemic and its impacts on the job market. Previously, I found that certain occupational areas like construction and food service were impacted more than others when it comes to opioids, and that specific jobs seem to have higher rates of injury and compensation claims, such as healthcare and transportation. This year, my hope is to continue to build off this while considering the impacts of COVID-19 to see how the combination of both major public health problems have further impacted job availability and employment. Last year, my research focused on a broad scale, but I would like to take that information and analyze specifically the region of Indiana County. I will be pairing my quantitative research with anthropological strategies like interviews and will bring both into one combined multi-method approach. This region, along with many others in Appalachia, have been harmed by the opioid epidemic and now with the global pandemic, this harm could be escalated further. To gather this research, I will be looking at previous analyses conducted while also gathering some direct information from local organizations and stakeholders in order to create a full picture of the problem in the hopes to bring awareness and potential solutions to the table. So it is evident that, um, that throughout the course of COVID-19, the fear and anxiety. Can you please go back to the last slide, please? Dr. Adams. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it is evident that throughout the course of COVID-19, the fear and anxiety of the unknown has created a significant, significant rift with uh, mental health for everyone, um, but I'm going to explore the risk factors that contribute to the adverse effects on the emotional being um, of others while in social isolation. Um, the key components that I'm going to address are food in the food industry, unemployment, uh, social media, and alcohol consumption and substance use. Um, Indiana County is a trans transitional ec like uh, economy, according to the um, Appalachian Regional Commission. Um, there are some new murals in our downtown area, um, including the uh, famous environmental activist and writer um, Edward Abbey, who is also from our county. Um, it's important to mention that 30% of IUP, IUP faculty has, sl has been slated to be laid off at the end of the spring 2021 semester. Uh, we have the highest rates of COVID that we have ever seen in our county. Uh, overdose rates are high. Um, we have some of like the two dirtiest power plants in Pennsylvania. Um, there is more food insecurity and more widespread unemployment that needs to be addressed for the sake of our community. But at the end of the day, we are resilient. Uh, 
Um, we just want to extend our thanks to everyone for listening to us and also the um, Chevy Chase Community Center, the Appalachian Regional Commission, and many more that have helped us throughout the, um, throughout the course of our project, as well as faculty advisors.